This is A World on Purpose. A purposeful life is the most important kind and the most valuable kind of life. Every choice that we make makes a difference, for better or worse. I love walking in a village and seeing the before and after. This is the podcast dedicated to those humans choosing to live larger by working for the greater good. And these are their stories. Stories of hope and of true change that come from living on purpose. What if you were to suddenly say there are no challenges, there are only opportunities? Regardless of where you come from, your financial identity should determine where you end up in life. I'm your host, Alyssa Fisher-Harris, and my hope is that my inspiring guests will take you on an introspective journey that helps you tap into your own pivot to purpose, bringing greater meaning to your life. Welcome to A World on Purpose. Random experiences unbeknownst to us at the time can remarkably shape passions inside us we didn't even know existed and later spark invention to support that very passion. Sam Pardue, co-founder and CEO of Indo Windows, had his unexpected pivot to purpose in the late 90s on a shared commute to his job at Intel Corporation. Those rides with environmental scientists that would talk about the early issues of climate change formed his views and passions for addressing the eventual climate crisis of today. Listen to Sam share how those conversations with early adopter climate champions ignited years later Sam's state-of-the-art energy-efficient product that inherently supports the climate crisis he cares deeply about. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome back again to A World on Purpose. As you know, I am your host, Alyssa Fisher-Harris, and every single week we are dedicated to bringing you the most awesome stories about all these amazing change makers who are living larger than themselves by doing something for the greater good. And oftentimes, those are either companies that are doing social impact initiatives, or they're doing something around a nonprofit, or they're actually a for-profit business where inherently their product is something that is doing social good for humanity. And then they also have a little side hustle where they are helping humanity with, with a wonderful social impact initiative. And today is a perfect example of that. I am so excited to have Sam Pardue here, founder of Indo Windows. Um, Sam is one of the most interesting people I've ever met, uh, honestly, and uh, I say that about everyone that I'm just thrilled, but the truth is every person that I get to bring on here has some unique, amazing nugget and experience and just an incredible backstory, and so I'm just proud uh, and honored to have people like Sam here today. I'm going to give you a quick little snippet before I introduce Sam. Sam is a serial entrepreneur. Uh, graduating from Carnegie Mellon in the late 90s, he ran it ran, ran right into big corporate working for Intel Corporation before the entrepreneurial bug bit him. And ever since then, he's founded two, uh, co-founded two successful companies. One, I'll let him describe the first one. And then the second one is the one we're going to talk about today, uh, kind of in detail, which is Indo Windows. So with that uh, amazing introduction, Sam Pardue, welcome to A World on Purpose. It's wonderful to be here sharing my story with your audience. So I'm, like, I'm excited about the conversation. Thank you. Well, you, you're, you're definitely, um, you fit the ethos both as a human being um, in, in your own personal beliefs and values, and then also how you have uh, shaped this incredible company. So, you know, the first, uh, you've been following the show, and um, I'm just so, uh, so thrilled that you were willing to come on this and, and share your story. You know, the first segment usually is around giving people from your words, from your mouth, from your heart, your origin story, and that thing we keep calling pivot to purpose. So why don't you go ahead and dive in and start telling our guests all about Sam Pardue. Sure. I'm saying, so, I'm saying that right, right? It's Pardue. Pardue that's right. Okay, yeah. good. like to get the names right. I think it's a French name originally, but it's gotten a little bit Americanized over the years here. Cool. But I, I had a really great job at Lens Baby. I was the co-founder of Lens Baby, which is a special effects camera lens manufacturing business. And I got to travel all over the world meeting with really creative people, photographers and, and digital creators and things like that. And it was a lot of fun. But I had been concerned, remain very deeply alarmed about climate change. And Though my life and my career were going along great with Lens Baby, this, this uh, company that we started to make these really wonderful camera lenses, I was really concerned about what I could do to help combat climate change. And so I started thinking about my own space, my own house. 
At the time, I was living in a 1906 Portland Craftsman house, and it had beautiful divided light windows with rippling glass. And then I learned that the wood that was in the windows was old growth timber, and there was the handcrafted quality to them. And I realized that no matter how expensive of a replacement window I got, I was going to lose a lot of charm of those beautiful, lovely but leaky original windows. So my big aha moment came when I just started working on a solution to my own problem. And, and we, I basically was working with a magnetic system to try and solve my window problem. But uh, we eventually invented the endo window. And when we did this really remarkably simple product, I saw what a huge positive impact it could make on people and their carbon emissions and their, and their homes and their offices. So I just felt this really strong compulsion to follow through and to take this device that I had uh, come up with with my friend Mark and bring it to the market to share it with other people. So that meant stepping away from a job that was going great in a company that I co-founded that was helping me uh, you know, really explore my creative side and buckle down and start a whole new business that was based on a personal mission to address climate change. So that's when things really shifted for me. And I really felt like uh, Indo connects really deeply with my purpose uh, on being here on this planet and trying to address uh, the things that I see rising in our world. And it, it's given me a lot of purpose in my life. Well, that's, that's um, it's really cool that you, I mean, Part of what is so interesting about purpose-driven folks is that they can be on a trajectory somewhere and then something inspires them to kind of take a, that pivot, right? And it sounds like that's what you had. I found you through doing my research on trying to find window inserts for these beautiful windows that for anyone who's actually watching the show versus listening, you can see them in the back. Same thing, um, both for, from an from a, environmental standpoint of uh, energy efficiency, but also for sound, which, you know, sound pollution is, can be really hard for people too, right? Um, so you were addressing sound along with uh, the idea, uh, noise pollution along with, you know, yeah. efficiency. Helping people enjoy quiet has become a big part of what we do at Indo because uh, these window inserts we make, they just press inside your window frames with no mounting brackets. So they don't change your existing structure at all. They preserve your existing windows. Mm -hmm. but they block 100% of the drafts or the air conditioning loss. They also block up to 70% of the noise coming through your windows. And they save you about 20% on your energy bills, regardless of what your motivation is for purchasing them. So I kind of consider myself, you know, my first impetus for this business was my concern about the environment, concern about our planet, but I also was really concerned about historic preservation because I didn't see the point of ripping out something that was perfectly good if you could just enhance it and make it work the way it was. So I'm, I'm kind of an accidental historic preservationist, a very intentional <laughs> environmentalist. But now, actually, I'm helping many thousands of people enjoy quiet in their homes and their workspaces. And that feels great to me, too, because I do not like hearing the barking dogs or the <laughs> garbage trucks or what have you rolling by outside. I like a nice, quiet space, too. Yeah, and actually on one of the shows that will be, uh, be broadcasting, and unfortunately, I really needed your inserts because the, the good old garbage truck came by at the wrong time. It never comes, and there it was, and I couldn't do anything about it. So, you know, it would have been great. Um, let's backtrack a little bit, though. I want to get into the technology around mm -hmm. Indo for sure, because it's, it's so brilliant the way you guys developed it. And when you told me the story around your partner, Mark, Mark correct? Yes. Um, who, how you guys just came about with the with the um, with the structure of it was so cool. But let's go back a little bit to your <laughs> background in environmental science because you really in the in the late '90s were kind of one of the early adopters, understanding the the desperate issues that climate change would bring to us, and that was a long time ago. Can you describe that a little bit in terms of? your education back then and sure. what you saw then as a foreshadowing to, to what we are experiencing now? Right. So I, uh, I grew up loving nature. Thanks to my mom and dad. I'm one of those lucky people who got to spend a lot of time outdoors. And so when I later on got a master's of international affairs, I got that before my MBA. So that was career number one. 
I, my first job was working at Los Alamos National Laboratory in a think tank that was studying arms control and nuclear weapons proliferation issues, how to keep the bomb under control. Wow. And, uh, but the lab had a lot of other scientists there, including uh, climate scientists. And I carpooled up from Santa Fe up to Los Alamos with PhDs in climate science and energy policy. And we would talk a lot about climate change back then as being this incredibly difficult problem to solve from a policy point of view and a politics point of view. And uh, so I got a very early introduction. This is about 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And everything we talked about back then is now happening, but it's happening faster and it's happening worse. And I think what was really hard for us to appreciate back then is how hard the carbon extraction industries would work to defend their turf and in the face of overwhelming scientific evidence and how much they would really work to undermine uh, a really useful dialogue in the public space. So you've kind of got three levels to the climate problem. You have uh, the science, and then you have policy, and then you have politics on top of that. Mm -hmm. And the politics have been horribly messed up. It was partly because of my background and knowing how hard it would be for governments to do the right thing. When I invented the endo window insert, Part of my inspiration for starting the company was to do something as a for-profit company that could help reduce carbon emissions. And if we could make it a really successful enterprise, we'd block more and more carbon emissions. So it kind of had a, from the very beginning, Indo had a nonprofit purpose, yeah. but it was a for-profit enterprise because that we felt that was the way that we could make a difference independent of any government work or you know, regulations or anything like that. We would just start this flywheel of innovation and reinvest in the company's growth. And that's how we could personally make a big impact on the climate. So it was really kind of informed by those conversations in the car because I already knew how hard the politics would be to get really good, aggressive governmental action. So I was partly inspired to start a company because of that. And I, I love that because that's just, it, it's so incredible that you can think about, you were having these discussions 25 years ago in almost a predictive way. And now we're living it to your point. Um, and so I think that that's just really, really powerful to understand how these discussions, because I think they're not to discount anybody's intelligence who hasn't maybe been following this for a while, but m maybe the majority of the population is just, it just has only come to everyone's attention in the last 20 years, right? With the sustainable development goals but, um, or maybe even the last 10 years really being a very serious discussion. So the fact that you were on the forefront of that is, is, is pretty amazing. Um, I wanted to get into uh, the design of Indo Windows. And in part two, we're going to kind of go into a little bit deeper of that and also the kind of initiatives that you're working on. But I'd like to talk a little bit about Lens Baby. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, for the reason I want to talk about that was because that was your big step into entrepreneurship. And did that company inherently have any part of it that was sort of social impact driven? And, and even if it didn't, the fact, again, that you were willing to step away from a very happy, successful career to take on something unknown, I really love for our guests to hear about that because sometimes people might be afraid to take that leap um, away from something that's comfortable into mm -hmm. something that is unknown. So I'd love for you to talk about that and your experience with that so that people can learn what it was like for you, and maybe they can they maybe they can get some inspiration from it. Sure, the, the Lens Baby story is kind of amazing. Uh, my partner, the co-founder of Lens Baby, is Craig Strong. He's the inventor of the Lens Baby, and I was actually helping him with his photography business, doing a little bit of marketing, consulting for him. When one day he walked into my office with this crazy-looking apparatus, it was a camera lens. And he tried to explain it to me, but you focused it by squeezing it, and then you tilted the lens all around, and it may move the sharp area of focus all around the image. And do you want to start a company selling these things? And I thought it was kind of crazy because, like a camera lens, you squeeze the focus, that's like insane. Nobody does that. <laughs> uh, but I had enough humility to not rely just on my own personal opinion. I, I was like, well, how many people have tried this? Have there have been any beta testers? And there were. And so I. I created a poll, a survey, and I surveyed them. They're all like, yeah, it takes amazing photographs, and it's a lot of fun. And so Craig and I uh, decided to start up this company as 50-50 partners, but we did it in an incredibly naive way. <laughs> I thought I was really smart because I'd gone off and got my MBA, then I worked at Intel, and I was like, then I stepped out on my own. 
And this was going to be my first venture, but we were like crazy naive. We actually started the whole company with $5,000. That's it. You started a consumer electronics company with $5,000 and nobody did that. But I just had this insight that we could start selling direct uh, to consumers and use this new thing called Google to reach people really efficiently and have a super streamlined business operation that can be profitable right from the beginning. And so we spun it up and it became a a really nice size, thriving uh, niche player in the photography business. Still around today, making the best lenses it's ever made, which is amazing. But um, we didn't actually start that business because it started so kind of randomly. We didn't have a lot of thought about what its mission was or what its purpose was. And when I stepped down from the CEO of Lens Baby to start up Endo, it was one of the things I reflected on that I could have done better would be to infuse Lens Baby with more of a real purpose. Now, Lens Baby serves creativity, which is a wonderful thing. It's one of my deepest passions, actually. You know, there's the world and then, you know, being creative human beings in the world is, is super fun. So Lens Baby helps photographers see in a new way. It's an amazing uh, company and an amazing set of products. But I never really cultivated that sense of mission inside of the business as intentionally as we should have. And so I think it, it missed out a little bit during those early years. Now I think they've really connected to their mission much more strongly, and it really is about that creative vision and insight that, that people can have. But Endo was, um, you know, born a, a company with a purpose, and we were much more intentional about creating a company culture. There was all about this continuous learning and growth process so that we could achieve this vision of taking this kind of small company, but having a big impact on some huge issues, climate change is a huge issue. So if you want to try to have an impact on it, you've got to start out with some ambition and really, you know, continue to learn and innovate to get better and better at what you do. That's such a great explanation. Thank you for that. Because I think it's, it's, it's hard sometimes when people have a vision and an idea and uh, to feel like they can take that risk and, and a leap of faith and to also have the humility to know that, you know what, it's okay, your first company, though successful, maybe didn't have a mission necessarily attached, but it helped you rethink how you want to do other things. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. You know, I love that inherently too, that creativity was its purpose, which is super important and, and very powerful. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. We're gonna, we're gonna dive now um, into part two of the three-part series with you and we're going to really go into the nuts and bolts of Indo because it's such a cool design. I'm kind of like, I'm, te- I'm not tech savvy sometimes, but I'm like invention savvy. I love the way things are made and put together and the way that you guys came up with this to me was just so brilliant that I can't wait for you to describe it to everyone. So we're going to wrap part one. That went really fast, but we're going to wrap part one of our three-part series with you, Sam. And then we're going to go into part two, um, where people are going to get to learn about Indo. And I'm, I'm just super excited about it. So before we go, why don't you tell people where they can find you? You can find Indo Window inserts at IndoWindows.com. It's just like Window Windows, but drop the first W. Uh, because an Indo is kind of like a window, but it doesn't have a frame. Right. <laughs> so check out IndoWindows.com. I love it. It's a great idea. It's Indo goes into the window, right? And That's right. So, so we'll have to talk about how you came up with that name too, being a marketing guy. I'm sure that was something, something you thought long and hard about. So everyone, thank you so much for joining uh, part one of our three-part series with Sam Pardue from Indo Windows. We are going to dive really cool details into, uh, into the way that the windows were designed and described and everything in part two. And then in part three, we're going to talk all about the refugee initiative that Sam has attached to his company and some other cool things that he's doing that are addressing the COVID-19 crisis. So please come back and thank you so much for tuning in. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to A World on Purpose. I'm here today as your host, Liz Fisher-Harris, with my guest, Sam Pardue, founder, co-founder of Indo Windows. And we were just talking in part one of our three-part series with him around His awesome, awesome origin story, how climate change and his early discussions 25 years ago um, kind of, you know, launched him into this company that he's created called Indo Windows and some other really cool stories around the other company he created called Lens Baby and just 
a, such a fascinating background and, and taking giant re- li- uh, risks and leaps to start these companies, which I think would be really helpful for anyone who's looking to do that, but maybe a little afraid. So make sure you go back and listen to part one. Part two, we're going to dive in now to his company, his current company, Indo Windows. And I found Sam. Welcome back, Sam. Good to be back. Thanks, to be, thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, as I said, I found you uh, doing a search for inserts that could help with sound pollution in addition to um, the uh, energy efficiency. And I was so fascinated. I mean, your website alone with the video of the guy who puts the you know phone inside the window and then puts the insert in. I mean, that's so cool. For anyone who wants to, to see that, please go to the website. Can you describe to us how you came about with this invention, first of all, you, the way you described around the refrigerator and all that. Mm-hmm. And then I want you to talk about how you actually have this amazing technology that helps people get accuracy in when they're doing measurements and that kinds of things. So welcome back and please, please dive into this incredible company you, you've uh, formed. Cool. Well, the invention of the Indo is, uh, it's a fun story. And I think everybody out there who's listening to this, you can invent things too. Just uh, pay attention to what annoys you or what uh, seems challenging about your life. Uh, for me, I had these beautiful old windows that were really leaky and drafty and energy inefficient, but I wanted to preserve them and I wanted to upgrade their performance. So, The first thing I did was to create a magnetic system where I had a sheet of acrylic with a magnet around the edge and a a corresponding magnet on the window frame, and it would just snap into place. Uh, There were some real design flaws with that system. It was unattractive. It was kind of cumbersome. And so I wanted to improve on it. And my friend Mark was looking at my initial prototypes and he told me how ugly they were. They were not attractive and he was like, we could do better. So I finally relented and, and engaged, you know, started trying to work on improving the initial magnetic system we had come up with. And uh, we started looking at refrigerator doors uh, because they have a magnet inside them that seals the door. That's what grabs the refrigerator and, and holds the door shut. But it's embedded inside of an extrusion, which is kind of like a, a spaghetti you know, kind of thing. It's made out of plastic, but it comes out of a machine and a big kind of spool. Uh, so what uh, that magnet is, is kind of embedded in a little bit of a spring too. It kind of gives a little spring force. And the innovation that I had was we were working on improving the magnetic system by putting it into something like a refrigerator door extrusion. But the insight I had was, okay, we could just get rid of the magnet if we made that extrusion into a real spring that would hold the panel inside the window frame. I sent Mark a drawing, and then a couple weeks later, a few weeks later, a month later, I get a call from him. He's like, Sam, where are you? I said, I'm standing in my front hall. He's like, stay right there. I'm going to be at your house in five minutes. So five minutes later, sure enough, knock, knock, a knock on the door. And Mark walks in, and he's got this something hidden underneath a sheet. He sets <laughs> it down in the front hall, and then he whoof, lifts the sheet off, and he goes, there it is. And he had basically invented or created the thing that I had drawn up and, and sent to him. And it looks so beautiful, so simple. So if you look at an Ender Windows insert, the mechanical design is the simplest thing possible. And from a design point of view, simplicity is beautiful. Mm-hmm. All an Ender Window insert is is a sheet of acrylic glazing that's edged with our patented compression tube that runs all the way around the perimeter. And that compression tube creates a spring force so that when you push the insert into the inside of your window frame, it creates a spring in the even spring force all the way around the edge of the insert. And that holds it in place without a mounting bracket. Mm -hmm. And it looks really nice. It's very low profile design. It blends in right in with your windows. You'll hardly even notice that they're there. So simple. And when I saw that simplicity, that's kind of when I had the uh uh-oh moment. I was like, "Uh uh-oh, I really have to start a company to manufacture these things because this (laughs) is really beautiful what we're doing here. (laughs) So more advice to the inventors. The faster you can prototype your products, the sooner you can learn uh, from the world about how good it is or how bad it is or what problems it has. So Mark and I made prototypes from my living room windows, which, you know, one of them, the center one was five feet tall and four feet wide. So it's a pretty good sized window. And the, um, uh, the uh, inserts that we put in there, 
looked great. They immediately blocked out all the cold drafts and boosted the comfort. But one day I walked downstairs and that center window had peeled all the way out of the frame, <laughs> just cantilevered over my dining room floor. And I was like, uh oh, that's really bad. Why did that happen? <laughs> And it turns out that uh, while the invention was really simple, it was going to be a much more complicated business than we expected because 95% of all window frames are significantly out of square due to the settling of the home or maybe the original carpentry wasn't so perfect. And we put a rectangular window insert into a trapezoidal shaped window frame. (laughs) And so there was very little contact in the upper right-hand corner. So that's challenge one is the out of squareness problem. Challenge number two is the air pressure problem because the original window is very leaky, of course. That's why you wanted a window insert. (laughs) The air just kind of slips right through it. Uh, That creates air pressure. Our window inserts are really tight in the window frame, but the external window is leaky. So if you have a wind blowing on a window, it creates air pressure building up. Hmm. Problem number three is that uh, the acrylic will tend to slightly shrink as it gets colder. Mm. So all of a sudden, this incredibly simple product, I realized, was going into this very complex environment. And the only way we could succeed is if we got the insert to fit really precisely all the way around the entire window frame uh, so that uh, we get good spring force and resistance to air pressure everywhere across a wide, you know, across the full range of thermal expansion and contraction that the product might go to over the course of a, a summer and a winter. <laughs> So that is why we invented the laser measuring system that every single window insert we make is based on a set of precision six, six laser measurements, bottom, top, left, right, and the two diagonals. And we feed all that information right into our computerized cutting machine. We make each insert to be the exact shape of the window frame that it's designed for. And so if it's a trapezoidal, they're all trapezoidal shaped window frames, basically. That's what we make every day. And uh, we got really uh, concerned about quality because we didn't want people to mismeasure their windows and, or measure them and then have, the, have them go through the same thing I went through, which is an insert that actually fell out of the window frame. <laughs> so we designed our laser measuring system with a little bit of backup uh, error detection. So there's, some, there's a software program running that uses Pythagorean theorem and fuzzy logic to automatically detect when somebody mismeasures their window frame. When they enter that into their personalized web portal where they're entering in their dimensions, our software will almost always catch the problem and tell them to remeasure the window. Wow. So we've done about 100,000 window inserts so far, and only 200 of them have ever failed due to measurement error, which is an incredible 99.8% measurement accuracy which given, you know, the infinite variability of windows and the fact that we're having homeowners measure their own windows, it it means we've created a system to allow us to deliver this simple invention that's actually rather complicated, (laughs) but it works. And it works really well. And we're able to make a lot of people really happy uh, with their newfound comfort and quiet and energy efficiency. Yeah, that was the coolest part for me when I, when I saw your product, because I mean, I'm five, one and a half. I like to think I'm five, two, but five, one and a half. And I have giant windows in this wonderful new place I've moved into. Um, and I found it extraordinarily hard to try to measure, you know, myself on a ladder with a, with a measuring mm-hmm. tape. And it was just, it was torture. <laughs> right. Yeah, so the fact that you, A, could come up with something that's an amazing product that serves this purpose, B, that you could come up with a tool that is so precise and amazing that, you know, it can really help people with the whole measuring process, and C, uh, taking it to another level where, how do you take something like that that's custom and scale it? Because people are trying to do a lot of individualized things, whether it's supplements or you know, that, I mean, talk a little bit about that, how that, what the challenges were in that, how you overcame the customization of things for people. Right. When we first discovered the complexity of the window problem, uh, I was, I was, I didn't know whether we'd be able to find a solution Uh, because, you know, when you stack up all these variables, it felt like we would have a very high rate of failure of the product in the field, that people would mismeasure their windows, they would, or they would just, 
not perform really well or there'd be unsightly gaps in some area or squish to be in another area. It felt like a very intimidating problem to solve from a business point of view. But um, this is where the mission of what we were doing came in. I, I just felt so strongly that this could be such a positive impact on the planet and on people's carbon emissions that I had to keep trying to solve the problem. And that's where mission can really help a lot of people you know, succeed where they otherwise would fail is if you have a purpose, you'll fight your way through the resistance. So for me, it meant uh, kind of creating this giant diagram of how the information would have to flow through our company in order for physical product to flow back out across the country. Uh, based on that, uh, I had a nice conversation with another friend who was a web database developer and he ex you know, explained to me how we could actually create a, a system an IT system that would allow us to scalably solve this problem. Uh, of course, we had to go find a laser measuring device that would work the way we wanted it to work, and then we had to basically invent the software algorithm to detect the measurement mistakes. But we just kind of kept chipping away at this gigantic problem, you know, and then gradually the problems became less and less severe, and it became more and more possible for us to actually succeed. But we launched the company uh, on a really, um, you know, in a really beta mode with, a, I mean, full, full sales, but really just serving the Portland, Oregon market. Hmm. Uh, but everything was running on a spreadsheet and it was all, you know, we were really pushing our limits to get the company going. But again, like the faster you can push your idea into the world, then the faster you can start refining it and improving upon it. And that's exactly what happened with us. We launched the company and we've been solving problems and optimizing the system ever since. Yes. I, I, and I think, too, there's something really powerful around having the humility to know that you don't know it all and to really welcome the feedback from your consumers. You know, yeah. it, it's important because a lot of times when people are founding companies, sometimes you can be so close to something that you might not see it. Um, you might not see what what the the stop gaps are, miss, missing things, and so the fact that you were so, you know, so welcoming of people's feedback, so that you can make the best possible product, I think speaks a lot to to who you are as a founder and your other co-founder, Mark. Um, hi, Mark. We'll <laughs> maybe get to meet him at some point. Um, I would love to talk a little bit about. Um, Oh, the, the, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, is since you are so much about climate change and, you know, impact in the, the product itself, have you researched, if you guys, I'm, I'm guessing you probably have researched, you know, the best way to have the least, uh, the, the best kinds of materials inside the products so that they're making the least impact on the environment as well? Well, our product is made out of silicone and this optical grade acrylic. And... The silicon is designed, and, and these, these materials we're using are designed to have a very long lifespan. And I think that's a really important thing. It, our product is designed to be permanent, and it's uh, going to last a very, very long time. And then at the end of its lifespan, the acrylic can be recycled. But we're designing the product so that it doesn't have to be recycled. Uh, so that's a really important uh, foundation stone. The silicon we use is impervious to UV. It also is, uh, you know, has a very good temperature range that goes from uh, ice cube trays to oven mitts. That's what they mm -hmm. use silicone for. And so it's also a very, very durable material. Uh, the materials that go into acrylic uh, include some hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, based on what I've learned about the politics of climate change, if we can find uh, ways for the hydrocarbon industry to use its products that are not going to destroy the environment, then it's not a bad thing because it creates a, a different pathway for them than burning the, mm -hmm. you know, those hydrocarbons and destroying the planet. So our acrylic is made out of, um, you know, some of the feedstocks in the chemistry come from the hi uh, hydrocarbon industry, but like I like to say that the um, material that we lock up into these acrylic panels is not going to go up into the atmosphere and end up destroying our ecosystem. And we've designed the product uh, to have as little waste in the manufacturing process as possible. We run uh, 
not a 100% zero carbon uh, facility, but it's very, very close to zero carbon. Actually, it might be zero carbon. We do burn some natural gas to heat the production area, but we're using biogas that's reclaimed from other processes. So it's not uh, a virgin hydrocarbon that we're burning uh, in our heating process. And all of our electricity is carbon-free electricity. So we're really trying to have a holistic view on our environmental footprint. That's great. And it's important for people to understand, you know, um, I think sometimes people get a little overwhelmed thinking they have to do everything 100% exactly, Mm -hmm. you know, environmentally friendly. And it's, it's, very hard to do. So yeah. as long as you're doing and putting your best fo- foot forward and, and doing as much as you can, that's going to make a really big impact on the environment. So I, I wanted to be able to um, call that out too, because I know that that's something you, you really looked at as a manufacturer, which is super important. Yeah. We're looking, you know, and we're never stopping that pursuit. We're looking at solutions that will use less materials uh, we're looking at uh, ways we can distribute our manufacturing to reduce the carbon footprint of the delivery of the product to the to the customer. So if we can shorten up that shipment to the customer, we're going to, we're going to reduce the carbon uh, emissions of that part of the fulfillment process, uh, getting them what they need. So we'll keep on that path, uh, always trying to improve upon what we've done. And I think it's a great way for individuals to live as well as for companies to operate. Completely agree. Um, well, this is super awesome. Thank you for sharing all of that in your in part two. We're we're going to wrap part two here, and then we're going to jump into part three around because you are in manufacturing. Um, you've created a pretty unique um, way that you hire employees and your culture and all the cool things you're doing there. That's what we're going to dive into in part three, and we're also going to discuss uh, some of the ways that your you know manufacturing was hit very hard with COVID. And you came up with some very creative, unique ways to uh, keep your employees safe and to keep everybody still employed and keep going. And I, and I love the outcome that you share with me. So we're going to let you share that with the guests. But before we wrap part two of your three-part series, please tell everyone again where they can find you and Indo Windows. You can find us at IndoWindows.com. That's I-N-D-O-W-W-I-N-D-O-W-S.com. Great. And also just FYI, I forgot to mention this in part one, but uh, Sam, his bio, all of his social handles and the website and everything will also be on the World on Purpose website as well. So thank you everyone for tuning into this awesome series with Sam Pardue. Please come back to listen to part three. I'm your host, Liz Fisher-Harris, and we'll see you back for that segment. Hello again, and everyone, welcome back to A World on Purpose. I'm your host, as always, Alyssa Fisher-Harris, and we are here back re-engaging with the awesome Sam Pardue, founder of Indo Windows, in his uh, three-part series, talking about his origin story, pivot to purpose, his first company, and this amazing company that he has uh, is now spearheading and developed called Indo Windows, and we're going to go into now... Um, about some really cool initiatives that Sam is doing in terms of supporting refugees and also how they have addressed the COVID crisis. So Sam, please uh, say hello and welcome back again to World on Purpose. It's great to be here with you, Alyssa. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I'm just so excited that I found you. Completely random. This is this is just makes me really happy. Um, so your Indo Window Refugee Hiring Program. Let's talk a little bit about your company culture what your philosophy is around hiring and how this inspiration for the We Hire Refugees uh, came about. And then we'll dive into some of the other things after you go into that, because it's really, it's really moving and very special. And I think uh, people will feel really inspired to hear about it. Awesome. Well, you know, talking about our company culture, we developed a company culture that was really focused on continuous learning and growth. And we talked a little bit about humility in the last uh, segment. But uh, that's actually one of our company values, confidence and humility, and two other key values that help us learn and grow our creativity and discipline. And at Endo, we thrive when we are humble enough to learn from the mistakes that we dare to make. So that's a nice balancing of confidence and humility. And we create you know, awesome solutions that are creative, but then we have to follow these really well-defined processes in order to consistently deliver precisely fitting large 
you know, trapezoidal shaped window inserts into people's homes. But, you know, the, the climate mission was really our, our kind of founding mission, but we realized that we're a company that exists in a social fabric and that social fabric, that community aspect has become an increasingly important part of what we do. And one of the ways that manifested early on in, well, not early on, but like uh, in 2016, uh, we had been, you know, we had hired a number of refugees onto our staff and they were just wonderful people. But during the 2016 presidential campaign, there was such horrible vilification of refugees in our country and such fear mongering about them. It just hit us violently in the wrong way. It was like, this is crazy because our colleagues, our team members who are refugees are, these are wonderful people. They're wonderful additions to our company. Uh, we'd be happy to have them as neighbors and they're making our country stronger too. Mm -hmm. So we thought that the voice that was missing from the conversation was the voice of business. And, you know, in another very audacious move, we decided that, you know, somehow because we had this direct experience with refugees, we should try to answer, or add something to the dialogue. And so we, we created a, an initiative called We Hire Refugees, and you can find it at wehirerefugees.org. And it's a platform where businesses can declare their support for the refugee community and, uh, and, and really kind of share that they, the conviction that refugees help make our, our companies and our communities and our country stronger. It turns out that when a refugee arrives in the United States, they're always legally entitled to work here. That's just by de facto when a refugee arrives in the United States. So, um, but a job is the most important way for them to become successfully integrated into our communities. So businesses play a really powerful role in helping these people find a new home and helping them share their talents with us. So We Hire Refugees has gotten over 250 signatories so far. It's an ongoing initiative, and it actually found its moment of you know, greatest impact in 2018. Uh, we were approached by Catholic Charities, or actually it was 2019, and we were approached by Catholic Charities, which is one of the refugee resettlement agencies in, in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And they were in crisis. All the refugee resettlement organizations in the United States are in crisis because their funding is tied to the number of refugees who are admitted into the United States. Wow. The number which has been slashed by up to 80% uh, by the Trump administration. Hmm. So... <clears throat> uh, with all these organizations at, at the, you know, verge of extinction, uh, our ability to re you know, absorb and bring in more refugees in the future is going to be severely limited. So Catholic Charities approached us asking for We Hire Refugees to help out in lobbying the Oregon State Legislature for some funding to keep the resettlement agencies in Oregon alive until uh, possibly a new administration would take office. And so we were really pleased to go down to Salem and help lobby uh, legislators in support of this legislation. And amazingly, it passed with almost unanimous bipartisan support from both Republican and Democratic legislators. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, it was really a rare and beautiful moment of bipartisan uh, work to address something that I think is going to be profoundly important. You know, the connection to, there was a connection, though, to our climate uh, mission mm. with We Hire Refugees, in which, you know, my belief is that with the amount of climate disruption we've already locked in, even if we start taking amazing actions to combat climate change, we're already looking at a future that's going to have much greater incidence of droughts and famines and floods, and also rising sea levels. And the number of people who are displaced from their homes in the future is likely to be an order of magnitude greater than what we have right now. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge problem because what we saw in, in the Middle East, we had one country go through a five-year drought and have a million people displaced from the countryside to go into the cities. And this helped spark a civil war in Syria, mm -hmm. which displaced several million people. But those several million people destabilize the politics of both Europe and the United States. And one of my great concerns about climate change is I think a lot of people are far underestimating the degree to which 
our social economic system can be destabilized by the dislocations that climate change is going to inflict upon us. Mm-hmm. So We Are Refugees was uh, an effort, <clears throat> is an effort to try and shift the dialogue about refugees in general away from them being a threat to them, these people being a resource for our companies and for our country and our communities if we can absorb them and welcome them. And that is really the kind of fundamental, uh, you know, hope that I have for the initiative. Um, Recently, we have partnered with another company, Amplia Recruiting, which is based in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And their leadership is uh, on the Republican end of the spectrum, and I'm more on the progressive end. But I really like that fact that We Hire Refugees can be a bipartisan effort to really kind of value these individuals uh, from around the world and the value that they can bring, bring to us. Absolutely. And you know what? It, it, it should be bipartisan. I, I think when we people get caught up in, you know, I don't want to speak for anyone, but it seems as though there's been a memory gap where this country was founded by refugees and immigrants. I mean, there was a lot of this company was built on all of that. And in conjunction with our indigenous people who were here already. So right. you know, to, to forget that that is how America was, you know, started and, and that we hope we could carry that ethos is, is really sad. And so I, I love that you guys have been able to create this program Mm-hmm. And bring bring a spotlight on it, and actually create bar pi- bi- bipartisan support. I think that that's really, really. Um, and it's worth noting that uh, you know, from a religious point of view, that some of the most important figures from the Judeo Christian tradition were refugees, such as Moses or yeah. maybe uh, Jesus, <laughs> as just a couple examples. Right. So, uh, yeah, we we you know, I guess people across the spectrum, I think, uh, can really find ways to be supportive of the refugees. I'm excited about that. We need more opportunities to have bipartisan engagement in this country. Yeah, I agree. Well, I I applaud you on that program. And I'm, I'm how many people does Indo employ right now? And what percentage of them are refugees versus uh, American born per se? Well, we uh, right now we employ 45, and I think the largest number of refugees we had on payroll at any moment was five. Uh, so, and at that time, I think we had, or maybe it was six, and we had around 30 people at that time. So, it's ranged right now. Uh, unfortunately, there's no refugees to hire uh, mm-hmm. because the number being admitted in this country has been so small. Uh, mm-hmm. So, uh, we don't have as big a percentage at the moment. But that was your desire all along, and that that unfortunate situation in the political uh, landscape changed the ability sure. for you to for your, you to activate that, right? Yeah, and I think you know one of the tenets of we hire refugees. You know, we um we want to hire the best person for the job, and you know, and if a refugee is the best person for the job that we can hire, then we hire them. But we also, you know, we we are big believers in inclusiveness of all kinds. And that really everyone is welcome to work at Endo, including refugees. And uh, we've been fortunate to be able to hire refugees in the past. We look forward to doing it again in the future. That's great. Well, thank you for sharing about that. I, I, for anyone who's inspired uh, to learn more about it, that information will also be on the World on Purpose website. And you can um, reach Sam to talk about how to, I'm guessing, how to implement that into your own company. Yeah. That's correct, Sam? Yeah, We Hire Refugees has a sign-up page, and we're welcoming new company and new signatories uh, every week. So everybody's encouraged to sign. Great. So knowing that you have these amazing employees from all over and from all backgrounds, and it's so welcoming, um, you do have a manufacturing facility. And all of these incredible people were unfortunately um, subjected to COVID, like a lot of the manufacturers in the United States and every other industry pretty much. you came up with a pretty creative way uh, that you described to me to protect your employees that has now turned into something that other companies have adopted. So can you tell everybody about this really cool thing you, you created called Clean Practice? Yes. Clean Practice was started because Indo had to react to the COVID-19 crisis just like everybody else. Uh, COVID, I think, is unique that every single organization everywhere in the world is forced to respond to this new thing and change how they're operating. 
and all at once. And uh, back in March, I had actually been tracking COVID-19. I started being concerned about it fairly early uh, for whatever reasons. Maybe it's my international affairs background, and I've always been kind of a little bit concerned about the next pandemic, but I had my eyes on it. And based on what I was reading about uh, what we knew to be true about the virus in China, I thought it was um, it was certain to spread very widely in the United States uh, once it got going here. I was surprised that the Portland area was one of the first three cities in the United States to have community transmission announced. Oh, so wow. back on February 27th, um, it was announced, or maybe it was the 28th, it was announced that uh, we had community transmission going on in the Portland metro area, which means untracked. We didn't know the transmission from one person to the next. It was just spreading. And uh, that was, I think, on a Thursday. And uh, on the Friday, that next day, I sent my director of research and development home because he had a really bad cough and it sounded not good. And so, I, you know, within less than an hour of him being in the, in the factory, I had him heading home where he could be safe and not get other people sick. But over the weekend, I wrote up our COVID-19 response plan for the company. I said, by the time I come back on Monday, we need to have a plan. We need to be able to communicate the plan to the rest of the team. So Monday morning, uh, we called an all-hands meeting in our factory, and we didn't have social distancing then because we didn't know. We didn't have masks then because we didn't know. So we gathered everybody into our production facility, and we basically shared what I had come up with, which was you know information about COVID-19, some changes that we were going to do inside of our factory to keep people safe including a, a cleaning regime of, of everything in the factory. And what was really, really cool that is what happened next, because it started out with, you know, an announcement of a response plan. But very quickly, we were able to get team members at every level of our organization involved in, you know, further refining the plan and implementing it. Hmm. And after a couple of weeks, I was incredibly impressed by the level of activity and participation from people across the organization and, and really working hard to make our, our production space safe. So um, I called my production manager aside and I said, hey, what is going on? What, you know, where did all these little colored dots come from that, are, that have shown up all over the factory? He's like, well, that's out of visual management. Uh, it's from lean manufacturing. And I was like, huh. And like, you know, and then we started talking about the other things that we had done. And a lot of, so in our response, you know, in a, in a vacuum of information, you, you lean on what you know. And what we knew at Indo was a lot of lean manufacturing principles because that's how we made our window inserts and made them with great precision and quality every time. And so what we had ended up doing is kind of organically relying on the business skills that we had developed over the years to become a really good mass custom manufacturer. Hmm. But now instead of, you know, we were using lean manufacturing techniques, but instead of eliminating inefficiencies, we were looking for and eliminating COVID-19 transmission vectors in our workplace. Hmm. So I was like, huh, so it's lean, but it's for COVID-19. Well, how about we call it, and there's a lot of cleaning involved. Let's call it clean practice. <laughs> Brilliant. Genius. <laughs> so, but um, I shared uh, what we were doing at Indo and kind of our response plan. I shared it on LinkedIn. I was like, you know what? I, I bet a lot of other people might need uh, COVID-19, you know, some idea of what, what to do. So I shared our story on, on LinkedIn and I got more comments and responses to that post than any other that I've ever done on LinkedIn, not, not a big social media maven, but anyway, I kind of sensed that there was a need there to share what we were doing with a broader audience. So we created a website called cleanpractice.org and we put on there our COVID-19 response plan, but in template form so other organizations could just, you know, copy and paste in their name and then they would have a good starting place and then they could customize it further for their own business. We have also done a number of free webinars to share uh, basically the principles of clean practice, which are uh, you know basically a basket of tools that people can use in order to uh, go through their space and identify COVID nineteen vectors and eliminate them. But really, there's there's two goals. One is safety, 
And the other one is team morale. And I think that's something that a lot of people are kind of missing in the equation. Um, and that is that if you have a really good COVID-19 response, you can really enhance your company's or your organization's morale. But if you have a bad response, it can really degrade everything that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's been really easy for knowledge workers to flee their homes and work from home. Uh, but there's a ton of people that need to be in their workplace in order to do what they do. And if you're a manufacturing company, there's no way to run a manufacturing company with everybody working from home. Right. And that's really why we were so concerned about doing something uh, was because we knew that while the Googles and the Amazons, everybody else could just send everybody to work from home, we'd never be able to do that. And so we needed to have a proactive response to keep our team clean. So we, we put everything together into clean practice, um, and the, we've done a bunch of webinars to help educate people on how to implement it. But what's really cool about clean practice is it's about safety and it's about morale. And the best way to get great outcomes for both safety and morale is to engage as many people at every level of your organization as possible in creating the response. And so we try to share some easy techniques for uh, allowing more people to participate. Mm -hmm. And one of them is called a clean Gemba walk. Gemba is a Japanese word for space. And uh, in lean, a lot of lean manufacturing principles came from Japan uh, following World War II. Uh, Alfred Deming went over there and he trained a bunch of Japanese corporations in modern management uh, styles. And lean really was the codification or the, you know, the, uh, use of those in Japan. And then American companies have now like learned a ton uh, from the Japanese about how to run really efficient manufacturing businesses. And, but it's all based on this lean principles. Hmm. One of them is a Gemba walk where you walk through the manufacturing floor and you're looking for things that maybe need to be addressed. Senior management joins with the people in that work area to work through that space, walk through that space. And you're usually looking for things like inventory is building up in this area. That indicates a bottleneck in your manufacturing line. So that's something we need to address, right? Hmm. But a clean gimbal walk is walking through your space and looking for COVID-19 transmission vectors with lots of members of the team doing the walk with you. So you make it as participatory as possible. You identify surfaces that need to be cleaned and you put a colored, a colorful sticker on that surface. Hmm. If more than you know, more than one pair of hands touches the surface in a 72-hour period of time, any 72, then you need to be cleaning that surface really regularly. Mm -hmm. So it gets a colorful dot. Uh, you hang signs up. You look for where air could be stagnating, where people might be gathering and there's not enough air circulation. You look for where there needs to be social distancing. You document all this stuff. You get as many people involved in that process as possible because when they get involved, they get ownership. When they get ownership, they follow the guidelines more vigorously. They absorb the information. They internalize it better. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what we found at Endo was that clean practice has helped keep our team safe, but it's also really helped our morale at a very high level. Like um, a lot of other companies, you know, our non-manufacturing people have dispersed and are work re working remotely, which is the best practice. It actually keeps our factory workers safer because there's less vectors for COVID-19 to come into our workplace. So I'm working from home today. <laughs> um, factory's right down the hill. <laughs> I'll go visit. But um, so the um, so our office team did disperse uh, pretty early, but our factory workers have continued to work. And so far, we have not documented any, um, any COVID transmission that's happened in our workplace where one person came into work sick and got another person sick. Uh, what's really foundationally important about clean practice is that it encourages the building of trust because if you have trust then people will share information really openly with each other and that helps you respond to potential danger and shifting terrain right. uh, one of the things about COVID is we've learned more continuously through this crisis and if you continue to be in if you continue to be in operation the way Indo is continue to be in operation you need to update your practices Mm -hmm. But trust allows the free flow of information. We did actually, um, we won an award from the Oregon Entrepreneurs Network for our clean practice initiative. Ah. It was awesome. The day I went to film the acceptance video, because, you know, they couldn't do an in-person event, 
uh, I found out that one of my team members uh, had been diagnosed with COVID-19. Oh. Um, fortunately, she's working in Nevada, and, and so there's no risk of transmission to the rest of our team. But what's really powerful to me is that um, this team member sent out an all-hands email letting everybody know that she had been diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And she said that, uh, you know, she used that opportunity to encourage everybody to remain vigilant. Mm -hmm. Um, But she trusted us with the information that she had gotten sick, and she used her moment to really encourage people to remain vigilant. So um, trust helped her to share openly, and then that helped the rest of our team members behave more safely. In another example, another team member, uh, her husband was working at a facility where there was an outbreak. He was directly exposed to somebody who was diagnosed with COVID-19. She trusted us to share the information with us, and that allowed us to change her job responsibilities Mm -hmm. so she no longer had to come into the the factory. We gave her work that she could do at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, we didn't you know, we didn't have a guideline in place what to do if your husband is exposed to COVID-19, but the fact that trust existed in the organization allowed people to share information openly, which then allowed us to come up with a really good response really quickly on the fly. So I think trust is uh, super important. It's going to remain really important as we go into the vaccination phase. Uh, People have got to trust the information and the breakdown of trust in the United States is fundamentally Uh, one of the reasons why we've had such a terrible response in our country, such a pathetic response in our country. Um, And so I think clean practice is a way for organizations to take over some more of the responsibility for themselves and not wait for the government to sort everything out. It's a way for you to try and teach best practices through the relationships that you've developed at work so that people not only behave safely at work, they take those safe behaviors home. And I think that's a really uh, great outcome that can happen as well. To me, that's the best way you could end this three-part series. Um, Thank you so much for sharing that, Sam, because I I think that speaks a lot to where we are right now in the world. Um, And not just about COVID, but, you know, um, trust comes from leadership from the top down. And it's a really good example of you stepping into that and saying, how can I take care of my people, but how can I also be inclusive in giving them buy-in to it so that they, they feel like they're a part of the solution and you're not just shoving mandates down their throat and mm-hmm. then that trust is gone. Um, I, I love how you did that. And I think that that's something that I think there are you know a lot of leaders out there who do it, but for those who maybe aren't sure that that might be the right way, it's a really great example. And just to quickly close this clean practice, you said you have over 550 organizations that have downloaded the, uh, the free templates and tools, which I think speaks a lot to what you developed too. Um, so uh, Sam, it's really, really awesome to have you here. I wish I could talk to you for like another hour. I might have to have you come back and, and tell us how many more Indo window inserts you've sold, including myself. I'm going to be part of that here in the next year. Um, thank you. For, for sharing your incredible story and for all that you're doing for um, the planet and climate and humanity uh, at every level. Well, thank you for sharing our story. Uh, I think what uh, the team at Endo is doing is really special and I'm, I'm grateful to work with them and, and we're grateful to try and share what we're doing with other folks any way we can. And so cleanpractice.org is a resource. I think it's still really valuable because I think we have months and months to go before the vaccines finally get us out of this mess. And, uh, you know, I guess if I wanted to close with a thought is that everybody can identify ways that they can engage with the problems that we're facing in this world. And it's, it's so much better to engage personally with a response of your own uh, rather than wait for somebody else to solve the problem, I think it makes life more enjoyable and more meaningful. And it's certainly, you know, having a proactive and positive response to the COVID-19 crisis has helped me endure and actually feel less oppressed uh, at a time that's been so challenging for so many of us. Yeah, that that's a really beautiful thing to end with. Thank you for that final thought. Seems like 
that that's just your ethos and how you live your life in general from, you know, the, the beginning of your career all the way through that thread seems to exist. So Sam Pardue of Indo Windows, thank you so much for being on A World on Purpose. It means the world to me that you're here to tell your story. And before we wrap, please one more time, tell everybody where they can find you in Indo Windows. Please find us at indowindows.com. That's I-N-D-O-W-W-I-N-D-O-W-S.com. Excellent. And everyone, for you, for all of you who tuned in, you can find all this information also at A World on Purpose uh, about Indo Windows, about We Hire Refugees, about Clean Practice. Please take a listen and share this uh, series with people. I think it's really inspiring to, to help encourage anyone to get into their own pivot to purpose to be a great leader and to, uh, as Sam said at the end of this, you know, take matters into your own hand and, and stand for um, what you believe in. So thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. I'm your host, Alyssa Fisher-Harris, and we will see you on the next series. Thank you for taking this journey into a world on purpose with our incredible guests. To learn more about our amazing guests and their inspiring purpose-driven work, please go to aworldonpurpose.com. Don't forget to look at our call to action of the week to mobilize your desire for purpose into action. A World on Purpose can be found on Apple Podcasts and all the major podcast platforms, and the video version can be found on YouTube. If what you heard today inspires you, please write a review and like and share on the platform of your choice. We'd love to also hear from you and learn your pivot to purpose and the meaningful work that you do that lifts humanity. Send your stories to info at aworldonpurpose.com. I'd like to thank our World on Purpose team for making this show a reality. Once again, I'm your host, Alyssa Fisher-Harris. Thank you for tuning in to A World on Purpose. I look forward to seeing you soon.